Hi everyone and welcome. It would be hard to cover North East stories without covering the story of Mary Ann Cotton. As to whether I bring anything new to the story remains to be seen, but I hope you will find it interesting as I have done a lot of research into the story of her life. Please do let me know what you think in the comments and please give the video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want to hear more stories like this one or more stories of the history of the North East. This one is a somewhat slightly long one, but I think it's worth including as much information as possible. Mary Ann Cotton is thought to be Britain's worst female serial killer of her time. She is suspected of many murders and at least 21 people who were close to her died over a 20 year period. These were 10 children, three husbands, five stepchildren, her mother, Margaret, and her sister-in-law, also called Margaret, and one lover. Her life is quite complicated with many husbands and children, and a lot of the information is confusing as articles tell different stories, but I will do my best to try and keep it in order. This is her story. She was born Mary Ann Robson on the 31st of October 1832 at Low Moresley, near the town of Hettenley Hall in County Durham, to parents Michael and Margaret Robson. Her baptism details show her father Michael as a pitman. He was later killed in an accident at Merton Colliery in around 1842. He was about 25 or 26 years old at the time, having fallen to his death down a mine shaft. Mary Ann would have been about nine years old at the time, and tragically his body was returned to the family in a simple sack with the words property of Merton Colliery stamped on the outside of it. This must have been an awful thing to see at such a young age. His death left her mother with little or no money to live on, and most likely nowhere to live, as their home would have quite probably been tied to her father's job at the colliery. Mary Ann is said to have hated that the family were so poor, and said that she would not like to be poor when she was older. Her working life is said to begin in domestic service when she was around 16 years of age. However, the 1851 census does not actually say this. It doesn't give her as having any job at all at the time. At around the age of 19 years old, in July 1852, she married 26-year-old miner William Mowbray, and they then moved to Cornwall. They lived there for around about four years. While living in Cornwall, Mary Ann and William are said to have had four children. Two of these are possibly Mary Ann, born in 1856, and Margaret Jane, born in 1857. If they had other children prior to these two, they are unknown names and dates of birth. It is still said, however, that the four children died before they were one year old, and it is also said that all of their deaths were recorded as being gastric fever. Gastric fever was a common diagnosed cause of death at the time, as it was easily spread in times of low sanitation, so it would not have seemed unusual for several children in one family to die in this way. William and Mary Ann moved back to the northeast and settled in Sunderland, and they had a further three known children, Isabella Jane in 1858, Margaret Jane in 1861, and John Robert William in 1863. Margaret Jane is obviously the same name as the child that had previously been born in 1857. In 1861, they were living in the Haswell area of Durham. John Robert died in around September of 1864, and in January 1865, William, her husband, died of the same gastric fever that had claimed his children before him, and Mary Ann had received £35 life insurance after his death. I have not found any information saying how much insurance money had been paid out for all of the other children, however at least one was insured to the sum of two pounds and five shillings. Their daughter Margaret Jane died shortly after her father in 
in around May of 1865, leaving only Isabella still living. After William's death, Mary Ann moved to Seam Harbour and took a job at Sunderland Royal Infirmary in the Fever Ward. At this time, she also sent her only living child, Isabella, to live with her mother, Margaret, and her stepfather, George. While Mary Ann was working at the hospital, she met George Ward, who was a patient there at the time. They quickly became a couple and married in August of 1865. Just over a year after their marriage, George began to get symptoms of gastric fever and he died in October 1866. Mary had taken out a life insurance policy on him and she also benefited from his will. James Robinson, a shipyard foreman and a recent widower who lived in Sunderland, advertised for a housekeeper to look after his four children. Mary Ann applied for the job and she moved into his house in either November or December of 1866. Two of his children died of gastric fever within a year of her coming to live with him. This is most likely to have been John Robinson and Elizabeth Robinson. However, as already said, this would not have seemed unusual at the time for children to die of gastric fever and James does not seem to have been concerned that it was anything out of the ordinary. Early in 1867, Mary Ann went to look after her mother, Margaret, who had been taken ill. Her mother was beginning to recover from the first illness when she started to complain of symptoms similar to those connected to gastric fever, and she died in March of 1867, which is suggested to have been less than 10 days after Mary Ann had arrived to look after her. It was also in April of 1867 that Mary Ann's only remaining child, Isabella, also died of similar symptoms and Mary Ann had her life insured. However, it is unclear if she benefited in any way from her mother, Margaret's death. Mary Ann then returned to the home of James Robinson and they married in August 1867. They had at least two children, Margaret Isabella, often called Mary, who was born in 1867 and died in 1868 of gastric fever, and their son George, who was born in 1869. It seems that Mary Ann had wanted to ensure her husband's life, but he had refused. The marriage didn't last all that long after this, as it is said that James evicted Mary Ann for stealing from him and for having pawned some of his possessions. This is something that Mary Ann later mentions in a letter sent to James from her prison cell. James, it seems, had a lucky escape. So did George, who remained living with his father after Mary Ann left. Mary Ann was now homeless and it is said that her friend, Margaret Cotton, introduced her to her brother, Frederick Cotton, who was a recent widower. They clearly got on well as they married bigamously, as she was still legally married to James Robinson, in September of 1870. They had one son together, Robert Robson Cotton, who was born in around 1871. The family then moved to West Auckland, and Mary took out life insurance policies on them all. She would usually use the British and Prudential Insurance Company. It was not long after taking out the insurance that the first death occurred, and this was Frederick's sister, Margaret. It seems that Mary Ann had found out that Frederick would receive around £60 from Margaret's will. The next to die was her husband, Frederick, who was 39 years old at the time. He died in September of 1871. His cause of death is listed as typhoid hepatitis. His 10-year-old son, Frederick Jr., from his previous marriage, was next to die, and this was followed by Mary Ann and Frederick's baby son, Robert Robson Cotton, in 1872. This just left Charles Cotton another of Frederick's children from his previous marriage. In 
Although her reasons are unknown and some articles say it was due to a job she was offered that she could not do with a child in tow, but it seems that at first she tried to place Charles in the workhouse. However, they would not take him alone and Mary had no desire to enter the workhouse herself. Charles was described at the time as being in good health. This, though, did not last very long, and he died in July of 1872. It now seems really sad that the workhouse had not accepted him, as he would possibly not have died so young or at all. At some point after Frederick Cotton Sr.'s death, Mary Ann had moved to Front Street in West Auckland. Her lover, 35-year-old Joseph Natris, had moved in with her, but he died early in 1872 of symptoms similar to all of those before him. Mary Ann had once again claimed £30 life insurance from Joseph's death and also benefited from his will. It is possible that Joseph was a lover at a previous time, but the information is quite confusing, so although I've mentioned it now, I haven't included the earlier information about that. Some short time prior to Mary Ann's arrest, she had taken another lover. There seems to be some confusion over this person's name. He may have been known as Mr Quick Manning, but he may have also been called Mr Quick Man. Whatever his name was, Mary Ann was soon pregnant again. It was the death of the boy Charles Cotton that led to Mary Ann's downfall. The doctor who had been called to see the child when he had been taken ill had at first thought his symptoms to be quite mild. So on attending his death some short time later, he was quite surprised and it is said that he refused to give a death certificate. Mr Kilburn, who may have been the doctor refusing to give the death certificate, I'm not entirely certain, had examined the body of Charles. However, he had not felt at ease with his first impression of natural causes due to gastric fever and had therefore taken some samples which he tested and then found the presence of arsenic. He then contacted the police and the body was exhumed and it was at this point that more poison was found. The symptoms of arsenic poisoning are similar to gastric fever. They can both include nausea, vomiting, 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 diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever, cramps and convulsions. So those dying of gastric fever and those dying of arsenic poisoning would have been very similar. So if the doctor hadn't have been concerned at a somewhat healthy child dying so quickly, she probably never would have been caught. It seems that the manager of the workhouse, Thomas Riley, was also concerned. A newspaper article from the time states that Mary Ann had told him when she tried to put Charles into the workhouse that if he could not enter, then he would go the way of the rest of the cottons, to which Mr Riley had replied, You mean to tell me that this fine healthy boy will die? It would seem on hearing of the boy's death that he had also gone to the police with his concerns. Marianne was arrested in July of 1872 and charged with the murder of Charles Cotton. She was to stand trial in the spring of the following year. Whilst in prison, she gave birth to a baby girl in the January of 1873, who she named Margaret and who she also looked after during her prison term. The police exhumed the bodies of Joseph Natris, Charles Cotton, Frederick Cotton Jr. and baby Robert Cotton. They were all found to contain arsenic. However, it was not possible to prove that this had been given to them by Mary Ann and in the end she was only tried for the murder of Charles Cotton. However, she had been arrested for the murders of all the people previously mentioned. Mary Ann went on to sell her furniture and other belongings to pay for her solicitor's costs. A letter was sent to her in prison from a William Lowry, 
explain, explaining how, with her permission, George Smith had come to her house to collect items to sell to cover her costs. Mary Ann's trial began on the 5th of March 1873. She pleaded not guilty and was represented by Mr Thomas Campbell Foster. His defence was that the poison had been accidentally inhaled from the arsenic in the wallpaper which created a poisonous dust when cleaned with soft soap. Arsenic was indeed used in some wallpaper dyes and also in some paint at the time. However, the prose prosecution said that at least 10 of her alleged victims had never been in the so-called arsenic room. It was said that Mary Ann had purchased arsenic some six weeks before the death of Charles. However, evidence was also said to have been given during the trial by an assistant chemist who told the court that he remembered a woman coming to his master's shop in January of 1869 and asking for three pennies worth of soft soap and arsenic and that the woman was the person in the prisoner's dock. I have to say at this point that it would seem strange that such a thing would have been given as clear proof when the purchase had been several, several years prior to the murder she was currently standing trial for. But, as is often with the case, it is hard to distinguish which version of the story is correct, and this small part about the purchase in 1869 may not be true with regards to the actual trial. Several doctors were called to discuss the results of the tests done on the body of Charles Cotton, and some were also asked about the wallpaper poison idea. The prosecution suggested that Charles had been seen as a burden to Mary Ann, and a burden that she wished to get rid of. It was also said, as there was no one else in the house at the time, the only person who could have given him the poison was indeed Mary Ann. Although the trial lasted five days, I don't have much more information about it other than what I've already said. Most of it seems to have been medical and along the similar lines as the earlier information that I have just said about the doctor's reports. The jury took around 90 minutes to return a verdict of guilty of murder. The judge asked Marianne if she had anything to say in reply to this and she said, I am not guilty, my lord. Mr Justice Archibald then sentenced her to death by hanging and that her body would be buried within the prison walls at Durham. It seems this upset Marianne greatly and some newspaper articles of the time tell of her sobbing bitterly and needing to be escorted back to prison. After her trial, she did write letters to a couple of people. One newspaper discusses a letter sent to an unnamed man who she asked to visit her, and it also states, I wish to converse with you about getting up a petition for my life to be spared. The gentleman is said to have replied, but it is unclear if he visited her or not. She also sent letters to her husband, James Robinson. She was still legally married to him, though she did now use the name of Cotton. I will not read the full letter that I have seen, as it's too long. Her writing was said to be clear and bold, however, her spelling was not very good. The version I saw was a newspaper printed version, so I can't really say what her writing was actually like, but it was written exactly how she would have written it, so I've tried to read it as I believe she meant it to be with all the strange spelling errors. She asks for James to visit her and to bring the three children with him. These would be his two children from his previous marriage and their child together, George. She also asks him to try and get her life spared and says that he will know that she did not do this and that it must be dreadful for him to hear the lies told about her. She also does suggest that some blame lies with him for evicting her from their home. She once again asks him to find a way to get her life spared and concludes by asking him to reply by return post. James Robinson never replied to her letters and never visited her. 
and it is said that this did upset her quite a lot. I did find it strange to think that she would write to him in this way when he by now would be pretty sure that his two children who died were victims of her killing spree but there is often no explaining the mind of a criminal and why she would have thought that it was fine to write and ask him to visit. A petition was indeed got up for a reprieve but the Home Secretary declined this. Petitions it seemed were a very common thing in the case of murder trials where the sentence had been a death one and very few would actually be successful. Five days before her execution her baby Margaret was given to a couple for adoption. They were William and Sarah Edwards. They had previously visited Marianne in prison and appeared to actually be friends with her. A letter was sent to Marianne from Sarah Edwards addressed to my dear friend and it briefly states that the child is doing well and that she should not worry about it. I found it odd when looking at the letter to find they described the child as it, saying things like we had many visitors to see it and they say it is a fine one. Perhaps this was the way at the time but I did find that odd. Marianne continued to claim her innocence, including saying this to her stepfather George when he visited her the night before her execution. The execution was set for 8am on Monday the 24th of March 1873. Marianne had just a few sips of tea in the morning by way of breakfast. I have often wondered how some could eat a hearty breakfast as I know I wouldn't be able to do so in their position. As with all prisoners of the time she was pinioned, which means her arms were tied at the wrists, she was said to be wearing a black and white checked shawl. Marianne walked towards the gallows and she was described as being a pitiful sight. Some of my research led to me to a very detailed account of her execution and it is this I am using for the next part of the story. I am, however, not including all of the details as they are actually rather disturbing to say the least. On seeing the gallows she was seen to visibly flinch and begin to shake. She stopped moving and it was thought that she would need to be dragged further on, but she said she would walk. She was gasping and shaking uncontrollably and the hangman, Mr Calcraft, was working fast in his task to place the hood over her head. She was said to be saying, Lord have mercy on my soul and Lord take my soul over and over again. Her shoes were removed though I have no clear idea why this was done and once the hood was placed over her head her desperate breathing could be seen by all those close to her. She could also be heard sobbing by those present in the prison yard beside the gallows. It was at this point that her ankles were also tied. Evans, the assistant to Calcraft, was the man who drew the bolt of the gallows. Mary Ann dropped around only two feet and was immediately seen to be frantically trying to loosen the rope around her neck. In most hanging cases, death is almost always described as instant, but in this case it was clearly not. Her legs were kicking wildly and witnesses were struggling to view the spectacle before them. A low these were executions of murderers, a humane death was still preferred and it was felt that Calcraft had misjudged the drop and caused the suffering before them. Some say it could even have been deliberate but most felt it was badly done. It is said that Calcraft even attempted to reach down and push Mary Ann's body downwards in an attempt to end her suffering. The reporters who were watching were said to have never seen such a thing and many were overcome with great emotion at the very sight of Mary Ann's struggles. This sad spectacle lasted around three minutes until finally she lost her battle with life and succumbed to death. The female warders who had looked after Mary Ann whilst in prison looked on in shock and some were said to be struggling with their own emotions at seeing such a harrowing sight before them. The outline of her face could now be seen through the damp hood covering her face. The prison yard fell into complete silence. The black flag would be flown from the top of the prison 
to allow those outside to know that the sentence had been carried out and local newspaper reporters recorded the somewhat distressing scene in total detail for their readers to follow at a later date. As was the law, the body would be left to hang for one hour. Calcraft and Evans returned later to place Mary Ann in her coffin along with her discarded shoes and the black and white shawl she had previously been wearing. A cast was said to have been taken off her face, more commonly known as a death mask, and I believe this was used at Madame Tussauds. She was buried later that day in the grounds of Durham Prison. It is said that in the early 1990s, when the prison was being modernised, the graves of some of those executed were disturbed and Mary Ann Cotton was one of those disturbed. Several bodies, including that of Mary Ann's, were removed and all were later cremated. However, I have not seen any information as to what happened to the ashes after the cremation. I hope you have found this sad and tragic story interesting. I have found it hard at times to write as some parts of it, even for the death of a murderer, are very harrowing. And to put it in simple terms, something that I would never, ever have wanted to see. However, it was the, th the way things were in the past and things like this did happen. It might be interesting to note that Calcraft was not used at Durham again after this execution. Please do let me know your thoughts in the comments below and if you are interested in hearing more stories like this then please do subscribe to the channel and please give the video a like. Thank you for watching.